This podcast includes adult language and graphic depictions of murders and criminal acts. This is a comedy-style true crime podcast. We do our best not to make fun of victims or victims' families. However, we do introduce our sense of humor while telling graphic stories. If the mix of comedy and true crime is not your thing, this may not be the right podcast for you. Audience discretion is advised. On today's episode of Two Murder Morons, we'll be talking about Lawrence Sigmund Bittaker and Roy Lewis Norris. Ray Lewis Norris, did I say that right? I think so. Okay, yeah, it should be right. All right, and they're also known as the Tool Box Killers. Not to be confused with Toy Box Killers. Correct, yes. Yes. We'll also be playing the Wheel of Death with a lucky contestant today. Yep, that's right. And we'll be talking about that and more on Two Burner Morons. Walter Conkright. Walter Conkright. Pick my butt and everything else. There you go, guys. That's what happens. So you, get, you get yourself ready. Yes, that's the back backstory. So we're gonna talk about. What, the two. What, we gotta do our. That's what I was I, waiting on. Oh yeah, waiting. yeah, shit. Yeah, I'm like, I just want to win on to it. Hey! Hey! hey. Oh my god! Holy shit! Oh man! man. Hey! Uh, yeah. This has been a fun day of recording, has it not? Yeah, we have really screwed this up. <laughs> Man. The question is, do I show the unedited version of that and let it play? or Just do, I do it all. Just, yeah, just, just include, include it Just all. include it. Don't make it look real nice. Just include all the crap. Yeah, just, include all, just include it all. Let them see what the bare bones like. <laughs> don't, don't have to, you don't have to clean it up for me. Just throw it all out there. Give it all to them. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. <laughs> we record an episode. We let Mike have the show. Oh, my God. Well, <laughs> hello. Hello. And welcome. My name. You know who we are, or if you don't, <laughs> what, if you don't by now. What is happening right now? I don't know. Everybody's going to think we're drinking, probably. Oh Lord. Oof. Well, to, it's hard. See, this is tough because we're we're going off, and like inside me right now, I'm like, no, we're supposed to say our names. Yeah, I know. And I like watching. I'm watching your head explode. And I'm like getting. Am I getting sweaty already? I like can, I'm sweaty that we're not doing it right I know. now. I can tell in your little head. I can see it. Need the OCD to calm down. Yeah, exactly. So just let me do my thing, please. Okay. Okay. Your disclaimer. Well, hey, my name's Andy. Okay. Sitting across from me as always, it's my good buddy, Mike. Yes, it's Mike. And this is Two Murder Morons. There you go. Oh, thank you, man. Uh, I don't know if I'd have got through the episode without having to do my... You would have got red. You probably would have got red. I think I'm turning red already, aren't I? Yeah, a little bit. A little little pink there. Oh, man. And luckily, I'm going to remember this because I wrote it down finally. I finally got organized. No, oh, did you? Yeah, because we got to get a shove out. A shove out. A shove out. We, we give, shove it out. We, <laughs> we have to give a shout out to our newest buy me a coffee yes. executive producers. Exactly. Cindy Angel and Lori. Okay. There, there we go. And they won that by playing Wheel of Death on a previous episode. You're right. Yes. So we just want to say thank you for being thank executive for producers. Being producers. Um, and if. Uh, any of the rest of you watching would like to get bonus episodes or be an executive producer, get a shout out, get your name on the show to murder Uh, go to our support area and you'll see the link there to get to, uh, buy me a coffee. Yeah. You can sign up there. Yep. And uh, what else? I feel like right now is the perfect time to go over the, uh, screw up board. Oh yeah. And okay. see where we, see yes. where we're at with that oh, yeah. because, uh, Jesus Christ. Here it's on the it's on your screen too there, okay. buddy. If you can see, Let's see Andy forgot to do the slammer at top of the show. Yep. Yep. Uh where'd he go? Pronounce Hassan Sack as Hassel Snack. Yep. Uh, or Hackens. I said it wrong. I said it wrong again, Mike. I know. I, it it's yeah. it's Hassel's it's Oh my god, Lord you're, help you're, us. You're missing something on there. We are just starting this episode out. This is gonna be yeah, this is gonna be intense. Okay. You forgot something. It's pronounced Hackensack, mm-hmm. and I said Hassel Snack. Okay. I keep forgetting to do the disclaimer, which this has reminded me, and I'll mm-hmm. do that next. Mm-hmm. I said slash instead of scan, and I said link to the description of the article. It, it basically was a... Yeah, but you're missing something. What am I missing? The rock and sock. That was me? You made it all out. That's the way you said it. Oh, I see. No, we're not counting that. 
We're not counting that, Mike. If you, you if you don't know about rock and sock, go back to season one. <laughs> Is it a rock in a sock or a rock and a sock? Yeah. Because apparently what Mike, when I said this guy was beat with a rock and a sock, he was envisioning someone hitting with a sock and then and a, rock. a rock separately. Yeah. yeah. No, a rock in a sock. But you didn't say that. I said rock and a sock. Yeah. What does that sound like? Like you got a rock and you got a sock. And an in is being confused? No. This, this is being... And an in. Two <laughs> different words. I know. Okay. W- okay. You listen very carefully. Rock and a sock. What I just say? Rock and a sock. You thought I said and. Mm-hmm. I literally said rock in a sock. No, you didn't. Rock in a sock. Nope. <laughs> Not hearing it. <laughs> nope. 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 Oh, my God. Tell us, hey, hey, you guys help us out with that. Let us know who's right and who's wrong. <laughs> Go back to season one. And yeah. Just let us know who's right who's wrong. Oh, man. So the the, the error board, if you're new to the show, we keep this to uh, give each other crap and keep track of who screws up the most. Apparently, I'm in the lead by far. Hopefully, we'll change that in this episode because yeah. Mike's hosting, and I'm sure I can pick out and poke and prod. Yeah, you can. But this something. did remind me that we need to do our little disclaimer, which is, Exactly. If you are listening right mm-hmm. now on one of the major podcast platforms, we're getting ready to start talking about some pictures, and you're going to think, man, these guys are jerks talking about pictures on an yeah. audio podcast. Exactly. Well, newsflash, we are primarily a video podcast on right. YouTube and Spotify. So if you'd like to watch us, see our bright, shining faces, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and all the images we talk about, check us out on YouTube or Spotify. And obviously, if you're cool with listening or you'd rather listen, we're on all the major yeah. podcast platforms. So if you are watching or listening to the show and we say all these pictures and stuff, you know, like, those guys are assholes. What are they doing? We just gave you a disclaimer. True. Yeah. True. We gave fair warning. Yeah. Um, also, right now is a good time if you are watching on t- YouTube. Yeah, subscribe to us. Yeah. Smash that like button. Yeah, smash it hard. Click the notification bell to get notified of upcoming episodes. Yep. It's crazy how many, when I look at the analytics, like, how many people – Watch the show over and over again. They're yeah. not a one hit wonder. They're yeah. they're they're watching multiple episodes, but they're not subscribed. Yeah. Like help us out. Just subscribe. Just you know, we're trying to get to that five hundred. I think we're close. We're close. I think we'll get our goal at the beginning of the season was to get to five hundred yep. subscribers was, by the was. end of the season. End of the season. And we're kind of right smack dab in the middle. We're about to hit it, which is awesome. Yeah, that'd be cool. We're gonna get there. We're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. So, Mike, what are we talking about today, man? I just told you. Did you? Yeah. The toolbox murders <laughs> or killers. I'm sorry, toolbox killers. Yeah, that's what we're talking about today. Yeah, yeah. So what, I, I mean, what do you think? Should we get with this going? Let's get it, get it done. D- dive deep. Dive deep. Okay. Well, all right. Well, we'll talk about these guys. Okay. Okay. All right. Lawrence Bittaker. Actually, his name is Lawrence Sigmund Bittaker. He's got that famous. He's got that name. You know, it's kind of like that error. Yeah. You know, that, you don't hear these names anymore. Yeah, it sounds like a name from the 60s and 70s. Yeah, yeah. I, 50s, I, I, 60s. Yeah, I can't think of anybody with, with that name. Anyway, so, <clears throat> anyway, good old Lawrence. Uh, he was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, on September 27, 1940. And uh, as the unwanted child of a couple who had chosen to not have children, <laughs> he was placed in an orphanage by his mother, and... Uh, well, by his birth mother, and was adopted as a as an infant. So, at least somebody adopted him. Yeah, you know, wasn't totally unwanted. Um, Bittaker's adopted father worked in the aviation industry. Good job. Yep, uh, which required uh, the family to frequently move around the United States. Okay, so we had another one of those military brats. It's all going all over order. Well, I don't know if he, he didn't really say he was in the military. Just say he was in the aviation, aviation industry. Field, yeah. Yeah, but this kind of goes into we've talked about other serial killers, criminals, mm-hmm. and it's that that it's like that constant moving. Yeah, yeah, moving. You know, I'm trying to remember who it was we were talking about that moved like twenty times in a five year period or something like oh, that. What's his name in the first season? Uh, can't remember now. His dad uh, was in the military. Uh, Crap. Mm-mm-mm. It's the one from Chicago, right? I think so. Speck. Speck. Richard Speck. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he moved a lot. Yeah. When he was when he was little, yeah, like his family moved him around a lot, and he yeah. never really could settle at school and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So this guy is moving around a lot, and then eventually he's going to find out he's adopted, right? He's going to have that unwanted feeling, right? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Never know. So Bittaker was um, he was the first arrested, first time arrested. There we go. Okay, first arrest, first arrest 
okay, uh, for shoplifting at the age of 12. And, uh, okay. Obtained, That's not too crazy. Well, you got you have, you obtained a minor criminal record over the next four years after further arrests at the same office. Okay. Right, same offense. I'm sorry. Same offense. So a lot of fat, a lot of shoplifting. Yeah, he's a shoplifter. As a kid. Yeah. 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 Um, in addition to petty theft, uh, which brought him to the attention of juvenile authorities, uh, Bitteker would later claim these numerous theft-related offenses committed through his, throughout his adolescence had been attempts to compensate for the lack of love he received from his parents. Uh, okay. So he's already making up for some things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So although, this is, this word gets really good. So although reported to have an IQ of 138. Oh, dang. Okay. Yeah. I mean, okay. We're, we're morons. That's <laughs> low, right? Yeah. Like extremely low. Extremely low. Okay. Yeah. I just haven't talked about IQ in a while. Yeah. Maybe mine's well, down. Obviously, that's kind of, maybe why. <laughs> maybe mine's down around maybe 138. It might be. <laughs> might be. Hell, shit. Hmm. <laughs> Damn, I, when I saw that when I was reading this, you know, looking into the story, I was like, holy shit, the guy's a rock. I wonder why. He's a rock. Right. Um, so, Becker considered school to be a tedious experience and dropped out of high school in 1957. Okay. Yep. So, by this stage in his adolescence, he and his adoptive parents were living in California. Okay. Okay. So, within a year of dropping out, um, here we go. He had, he, uh, had been arrested for car theft, a hit and run, and evading arrest. Okay, so he's climbing up the crime ladder. Yeah, here yeah, with, we're, we're past we're past the uh, petty little theft. Right. Yeah, we're we're, we're going to hit and run. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. still, I mean, relatively minor. True, but, but much but worse. Evading, than, but you're running from the cops now. Right. Right. Yeah. So, uh, for these uh, offenses, he was imprisoned at the California Thor- Youth Authority, where he remained until uh, he was eighteen. Okay. Um, yeah. Upon release, Bittaker was, uh, discovered that his adoptive parents had disowned him. Oh, damn. And moved to another state. So they just hightailed it out of California. He was like, yeah, oh, we got him in jail. Let's God. go. So, I mean, not not to hug a thug here. but I, know, I get it. So he's, he's born <laughs> to parents who didn't want kids, who immediately mm-hmm. give him up for adoption. Correct. He gets adopted. He moves around a bunch. He starts doing some crime some that escalates. Theft. Yeah. And now when he gets out of this juvenile center, now the adoptive parents don't want him either. Yeah. And they hightail it out of town. He's got an IQ 138. Yeah. Anyway, so, yeah, he would never see his adoptive parents again. Oh, wow. So they really, yeah, they, they bounced. bounced. They bounced. Um, yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. So uh, that's a little bit about Lawrence. Okay. Let's talk about Roy. All right. Let's talk about Roy. Oh, Roy. Roy's a, got them, uh. Jail issued glasses. Hey, I have those same glasses. Did you? <laughs> jail issued? I mean, they weren't jail issued, but they look, you know, like the black horn rim. Wow. Okay. I mean, aren't you kind of wearing those glasses right now? Oh, no, we're near it. Um, that's pretty close. Uh, not really. Yeah. These are Oakleys. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm not getting paid to say that either. <laughs> wish we were. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. I wish it was. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, anyway, a little bit about Roy. Roy Lewis Norris, born in Greeley, Colorado. Ooh, I like Greeley, Colorado. Yes, nice area. Beautiful. Yeah. February, 5th, 19, February 5th, 1948. So he was born a year after his buddy uh, Lawrence. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Norris was conceived out of wedlock. His parents married to avoid the social stigma surrounding legitimate birth at that time. Right. Yeah, because that's that time where if you had a kid, a kid and no dad— Right. Kind of looked down upon. Because this is what, what would you say, like 1950-ish? Yeah, 1948, yeah. 1948, yeah. It's coming out of World War II, so yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, so yeah. So uh, Norris's extended family um, lived within a short distance of his parents' home due to his grandfather's real estate investments. Okay. Okay, so grandpa's got money. Yeah. Yep. Uh, his father worked in a scrapyard, and his mother was a drug-addicted housewife. Mm. Mm, great. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, God, man. He occasionally lived with his with his parents uh, throughout the, his childhood and adolescence, but was re- repeatedly placed in the care of foster families throughout the state of Colorado. 
So he's bounced around. He bounced everywhere. Different parent, different foster parents. Because mom's she's just strung out on drugs. Yeah. And dad's got it worked. Setting it up. So just setting it up for him, too. Yeah. Now, they don't know each other yet, right? No, it's not, no, it's not no. like these two are childhood friends. Colorado, California. Right. I have never met yet. Okay. Yeah. And no relation nope. to each other. No relation. Okay. Gotcha. They'll meet later on in prison. Gotcha. Okay. So Norris's childhood uh, relection, recollections uh, were inter- interspersed with memories of a wonderful accusations uh, while living his uh, bi- while living with his biological parents and being neglected by many of the foster families he lived with, which, okay. which is typical of foster care, we hear it all the time. So, you know, I, I hear mom, dad don't love me. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I would say it's typical of foster care. <laughs> I'm, there are well, plenty of wonderful foster parents out there. I don't I, think we should make the statement like true. You're right. All foster parents suck. Yeah, you're it's right. not true whatsoever. It's not, but it's <laughs> what we do hear a lot in yes. these crime stories. Yes, that in these instances where murderers are yes. developed, developed that they were foster kids who yes. were in a bad foster Correct. parenting situation. Thanks for pointing that out, Dad. You're you're welcome, son. I right, appreciate that. Frequently be so we say you know uh, neglected and then frequently uh, de- being denied sufficient food or clothing. Oh wow! So he he truly is neglected. Yeah, he's if he's being denied food, grown, grown up pretty hard. Yeah, yeah. So um, he also claimed to have been sexually abused. So oh. along with all that, guys claim of sexual abuse. Good, which Lord. you know. I swear, if you say that's typical of foster parents right now, I'm going to reach. Ah, oh, you'd say that. I'm going to reach across and slap I'm you. I'm just saying that we're setting up for our. I know his I know. life. I just had to give you crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, motherfucker. Anyway, uh, and when uh, in the care of a Hispanic family, he later he's stating the prejudice he held towards Hispanic people originated from the neglect and abuse he endured as a child when placed in the care of the family. Okay, so at some point his foster parents were Hispanic, mm-hmm. and because they abused him, that he's saying that's what led to him being discriminatory against all Hispanics. Sounds like it, yeah. Wow. Okay. So while he was uh, while living with his parents at the age of sixteen, so he's back at home. Uh, Norris visited the home of a female relative who was in her early twenties and began speaking to her in a sexually suggestive manner to his aunt. It was just, they just said relative. Oh, a female relative. Yeah, a female relative. Gotcha. And he threw me off and said, yeah. I was like, wait, how, how'd you get that? I made it I made it up in yeah. my head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. She ordered him to leave her house and informed Norris's father, who threatened to subject him to a beating. Well, I would, I mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you say the wrong thing like that. Yeah, what do you expect? Yeah. I mean, be glad her dad didn't beat your ass. Right. Yeah. Nora subsequently stole his father's car and drove into the Rocky Mountains, where he attempted to commit suicide by injecting pure air into the artery in his arm. I have never heard of that. Pure air? Just like an empty syringe, he thought, would do it? I guess. Is that... Well, okay. Is that like a wives' tale? Because I have heard before, like, you don't want air bubbles in your bloodstream. True. So is that a wives' tale, or is that something maybe could actually be done? Well, they always say when you get a... um, Like, from this medicine I'm on, they tell you to... Push the plunger and get the air out before you. Right. So yeah, it must have something. Must do something. But obviously unsuccessful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He obviously. He, yeah. Gotcha. He tried. Uh, he was later apprehended as a runaway and returned to live with his parents. And upon his return home, Norris's parents informed him, "You're gonna get rid again," that he and his younger sister were unwanted children and that they uh, intended to divorce when both reached adolescence. That's great news to deliver, you know? <laughs> wow, man. Hey, kids, come sit down. We just wanted to have this family meeting to tell you that we hate you. Yeah, we don't love you. And uh, we hate each other, and we're going to get divorced. So screw you guys. We, we hate each other because of you guys. Right. We probably would have been happy if it wasn't for you two. Like, like it was their choice to come into this life. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, you know, I never – I should have really looked up at his sister because I didn't – I thought – I should have looked to see where she ended up in life. You know what I mean? Yeah. What the difference take was. Oh, well, I didn't. That's on me. So a year later, Norris dropped out of school, and he joined the United States Navy. Okay. Okay. Hopefully get him on the, get him on the straight right path. and narrow yeah, there. Yeah, we've had a few join the, join the military in the past on the ones we've read. Yeah. 
Uh, he was uh, stationed in San Diego, great place, in uh, 1965, and was de- deployed to serve in Viet- the Vietnam War. Okay. On ship. A little safer. Yeah. So in 1969, although he did not see active combat during his four-month du- tour of duty, he was honorably, di- honor- honorably discharged from the Navy after one tour of duty. So the Navy used to do pup tours. Okay. What's that? I'm not familiar. My, instead of doing a four-year enlistment, you could, I think you could do up to, like my dad did a two-year in the 50s. Okay. So, so went to boot camp. He went to basic training. Went to his, his training for his MOS, and then by then, you know, you got like a year left. Yeah. So yeah. But you just did it because he, he grew up on a farm, eight eight kids. He was a baby. Yeah. So what you do? Yeah, you got to go do something. Yeah. Or you'd be pulling, you know, doing hay all summer. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, yeah. Hmm. Well, at least he went in the navy. So more on Bitteker. We're gonna go back to good old uh, Lawrence here. Okay, his buddy. Yeah, we, keep, we got some good photos of him. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's weird looking. Yeah, he I is. mean they both are, but he, him especially. Yeah, yeah. Within days of his parole from the California Youth Authority, Bitteker was arrested for transporting stolen vehicle across, across state lines. Okay. Yeah. In August of 1959, Bitteker was uh, sentenced to 18 months imprisonment. Wow. Okay. A year and a half. This guy's getting to become a like this is a, like this is how the path to be a career criminal. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's already there. Yeah. So he's just. Uh, huh. uh, he was to be so his uh, 18 months of imprisonment was to be served in the Oklahoma State uh, Reformatory. Um, he was later transferred to the medical center for federal prisoners in Springfield, Missouri, to serve the remainder of his sentence. Okay. Okay. Well, didn't really check to see what was wrong with him, but probably should have. Uh, in 1960, Bedker was released from prison and soon reverted to crime. Of course. Why not? Right. That's what you know. Right. Uh, within months of his release, he and uh, he, <clears throat> he had been arrested in Los Angeles for a uh, robbery. And in May of 1961, uh, he was sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. 15? Yeah. Dang. So career criminal at this yeah, point. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's there. He's reached, he's reached the point, but at least the, this they're not sexual in nature, right? This is all property crime stuff, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, while incarcerated for the uh, for this robbery, he was uh, characterized as by a psychiatrist as being highly manipulative, so he's a manipulator, which you know, a lot of them were, yeah, yeah. So, um, the psych psychiatrist also described Baker or Bittaker as having uh, considerable concealed hostility. I mean, I can see it. I mean, your mom and dad have, you know, the two, the two people in the world that should have been there for you. Right. Basically said, you know, back your backs, fuck off. Uh, you know what I mean? We're done right. with it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Bitterker was released on parole in 1963 after completing two years of this sentence. God damn, really? He has 15 years and in two years he's out? What do we always say, Mike? I know. California. I know. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. just... Mm. Uh, in October of 1964, he was again in prison for parole violation. And then again, 1966, Bittaker underwent further examinations by two independent psychiatrists, both of whom classified him as a borderline psychopath. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's pretty there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty much, uh, took you that long? Right. <laughs> yeah. He's a highly manipulative individual unable to acknowledge the consequences of his actions. He didn't see what he's doing wrong. Right. Yeah. yeah it's not this a big is deal. his life. This yeah, is, this this is what is, we do. Right. Yeah. This is, this is my life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, B- Bitteker explained to one of them that his criminal activities gave him a feeling of self importance. Um, although he insisted circumstantial, uh, circumstantial uh, matters pertaining to his environment and upbringing decrease his ability to resist committing, committing crimes. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, he, so he, they prescribed him an antipsychotic medication, and then a year later, guess what? He was again released into society. Yeah, just keep letting him out there. With the psycho drug this time, maybe right. he'll do better. Right. Well, my guess is that it doesn't help. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be my guess because I know where this is going, 
it doesn't help whatsoever. No. No, not at all. They probably gave him Ritalin. Yeah. <laughs> Back then, yeah. yeah. Probably didn't know what else. Yeah, probably know. not. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So in uh, 1974, Bittaker was arrested for assault with attempt to commit murder. Okay. So he's he has been climbing that ladder. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's like, slowly making his way up. The, yeah. Shoplifting, 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 auto theft, hit and run, and now we're, we've graduated up to... Assault with attempt to commit murder. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If it wasn't, you know, as long as it wasn't uh, premeditated, he'd probably get two years. <laughs> If, if that. Yeah. Uh, after he stabbed a young supermarket employee who had accused him of stealing. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> they probably knew. Well, yeah, he's he's probably, probably got a stolen got steak from- all inside his jacket. <laughs> kind of like on a, was a, on an animal house where he's stepping, <laughs> stepping all that food down him. How, how dare you accuse me of theft <laughs> as he's running and yeah, shit's just, just falling out. out. <laughs> oh, man. Poor guy. I not really. I don't really feel sorry for him. Um, the uh, supermarket employee had observed Bittaker stealing a steak. Oh, you call, I called you it. You so called that. <laughs> 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 and, and he followed Bittaker outside into the store's parking lot where he asked Bittaker uh, whether he had forgotten to pay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, that's what happened. It could happen. You know, he didn't, he didn't, have, he didn't want to, you know, Mess up the ozone layer by getting a plastic bag. Right. So he thought he'd just use his jacket. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was preheating this. this yeah, he was yeah, getting ready to go. Yeah, because you know, I don't I didn't have a place to do it. Yeah. I wasn't hot enough to do it on, on, on the car. Yeah. So, Bittaker responded by stabbing the pursuer in the chest, narrowly missing his heart. God, lucky guy. Yeah. Nowadays, they just watch it we'll go out. Yeah, let him go. Sorry, we'll slide it off on our pictures. I know. Okay, can I tell a quick side story? Yeah. So I applied. This is years ago now. But I applied to do loss prevention for Target. Yeah. And I got an interview. So I show up. <laughs> I'm Target's going to be so pissed that I'm saying this. Sorry. I mean, it's not like we got 8 million people. Is gonna yeah, yeah, things, yeah. But, so I'm in this interview, and they're, like, telling me how they handle shoplifters. And they're that's, that's the thing. They were like, you just... Let them go. Yeah. And I was like, you let them go. And they were like, your whole job would be just to inventory what's taken so we can file it with insurance. Yep. They were like, we don't want you confronting anybody. And I was like, I remember specifically asking, I was like, so if someone comes, if if I take this job and I'm watching cameras or whatever, someone comes in and puts a, puts an 85 inch, you know, at the time flat screen TVs were like $6,000, you know? Yeah. So they put some giant, you know, most expensive TV you got in this store in a cart and they push it out to their car. I do nothing. And they were like, nope, you just, you, there's a system. We keep track of what's taken. I was like, okay. I think they got tired of paying employees. Probably hospital bills. Workman comp. And, and then the, the, the lawsuits that came with it. Right. You know, the unwrongful detainment and all this other crap, I'm sure. Right. So yeah, I mean, it probably, I mean, you get to a point, you got to do that, I guess. I guess it's better to claim it yeah. than try to get it back. I don't know. I just thought it was. Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. I thought it was it's crazy. Kind of, kind of stupid. Why you have loss prevention then? Well, to keep track of the, to file it for insurance. Well, that's what managers should that's do. That's the whole manager. job was to, well, but the manager's not always watching what's being I, stolen. I, I, I know. I get it. That's a, They wanted an accurate number, you know, of everything that was being. I just thought that was crazy because, you know, we've seen stuff where loss prevention Mm-hmm. God, I remember back in the day at our mall that we used to go to, there was an LS Ayers. I oh, yeah. I don't know if I'm dating. LS Ayers has been gone a while, hasn't it? Uh, quite a while, yeah. But they're loss prevented. Dude, they used to like chase people down yeah, and yeah, pepper yeah. spray yeah, them and period. Lazarus. handcuff them. You walked out of Lazarus or Lazarus. something? Lazarus, <laughs> yeah. You get a beaten. Yes. Because that was expensive stuff. Yes. Yeah. Well, times are a changing, Mike. Yep, they are. And they, I mean, you know, they, you'd see security out there, you know, wailing on a guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, guy got lucky, didn't get, uh, he didn't hit his heart, thank God. Yeah. Um, so, uh, he attempted to flee, but was clearly restrained by two other supermarket employees. Guess he can't stab all three of them. Right. Yeah. Um, the employee, Gary Louie, survived the, sta- survived the stabbing, and Bittaker was convicted of a lesser charge of assault with a deadly weapon. Well, I would hope so. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, he was uh, sent to California Men's Colony in uh, San Luis Obispo. Okay. Hmm. Yep. So, uh, going to go back to Norris here. Uh, in 1969, Norris was arrested for his first known sexual offense. No oh, Lord. Yeah, uh, he started early. He started early. He was charged with both rape and assault with attempt to commit rape. In the latter incident, he had attempted to force his way into the car of a lone woman. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, three months uh, later, in February 1970, Norris attempted to deceive a lone woman into allowing him to enter her home. Uh, When the woman refused, he attempted to break into her house. And the woman phoned the police, who came out and basically arrested Norris before he had the opportunity to cause any harm. Well, good. Yeah, good. She She got lucky. Yeah. And then less than three months after this offense, Norris was diagnosed by a military psychologist with schizophro- schiz- schizoid personality disorder. Okay. So schizophrenic, basically. Yeah, yeah. 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 He was given an administrative di- discharge from the Navy under terms labeled as psychologic pro- psychological problems. Sure. Yeah. Probably gets paycheck every month, too. Probably. Yeah. Um, in May 1970, Norris, on bail for his latest offense— attacked a female student whom he had been stalking on the grounds of San Diego State University campus. Dang, okay. Um, Norris repeatedly struck her on the back of the head with a rock until she slumped to her knees. And then uh, before he repeatedly beat her head against the sidewalk as he knelt upon her lower back, and shortly thereafter, Norris was charged with assault with a deadly weapon. He was uh, committed to five years imprisonment. And... uh, that was at the uh, Alice Addis, uh, Addis Cadero State Hospital. Okay, is that a, I'm assuming a, like a mental I, yeah, hospital? Yeah, I would assume so. And it was, where yeah, we received as uh, was classified as a mentally disordered sex offender, basically. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sure, don't have those places anymore. No, they're shutting all those down. It's a joke. Um. Norris was released from the uh, state hospital in 1975 with five years probation. Jesus. Uh, five years probation. Yeah. So you have someone that's a diagnosed schizophrenic uh-huh. that's attacking females on college campuses with rocks. Raping. And and also raping. Rape. Yep. Yeah. And attempted and rape. Attempted rape. And basically with it, the rocks, he was basically killing her. And probation. Yeah, probation. Well, he did his time in the state psych facility for a few months. For for a few months? Because that really, you know, that's well, enough time to reform somebody. Obviously, in 1975, they figured it was. Good Lord. And so, uh, had be, having been declared by doctors as an individual who was of no further danger to others. So, they deem this after a few months. Uh-huh. He's no longer a danger to others. Yeah. And then three months after his release, Norris approached a 27-year-old woman walking home from a restaurant in Redondo Beach, offered her a ride on his motorcycle. And when she declined, Norris parked his bike, motorcycle, grabbed the woman's scarf, uh, twisting it around her neck before informing her he intended to rape her and dragging her into nearby bushes. Uh, Fearing for her life, the woman did not resist the rape. Although the rape was reported to police, they were initially unable to find the perpetrator. However, one month later, the victim observed Norris's motorcycle and noted the uh, license number. So just not to backtrack, but just so we're clear here, mm-hmm. he went to a facility and professionals deemed him no longer a threat. Yeah. And three months after he's released, he does this. Mm-hmm. I just want to make I just want to make sure I was clear on that point. Yeah. Because they want, they obviously wanted to get rid of him. They were tired of dealing with him. So let's just say he's he's good to go, and we'll just deal with the you know the consequences on you know down the road. But but that's my point. Do they? Do they? No, no. That's Nobody the does. thing. Nobody At what does. point do we start saying this is messed up? Yeah. That these professionals and see the thing that would piss me off about this is that if they would have done their job, what comes down the road would have never happened. Exactly. May have I mean, may have never happened. Yeah. This incident you're talking about now, or yeah. what were the real sick crap we're yeah. getting ready to get into, yeah. wouldn't have even been a possibility. Correct. That's what's that's the bullshit of it all. So not to get into some you know crazy almost political debate, but at what point 
do we start going backwards and saying uh, something needs to be done about us releasing these people? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Does that make it. sense? Yeah. Does uh, am I making? Am I yeah, making yeah, sense yeah. out I there? Mean, What's well, so different than now? I get I hear they just release them, you know, and put an angle marker on them. Like what? Like what? what what's uh, that? What's that do? By the time he cuts it off, he he's going to be you know be in Ohio. Yeah, I. Mm, so many frustrations with the system. Yeah, yeah, but they're just basically letting these guys in the seventies walk out. I mean, we still do it today. I, I know you still I, hear I stories today. Yeah. About, well, yeah. we you know, oh, this or that is yep. the reason, and then it's like six nights later after his release. Mm-hmm. Come on, Norse was arrested for the rape one year later, after because she you know she found it, saw the bike. Oh, okay. Got the tag information. Nice. And, I mean, good for her. You yeah, know what I mean? To remember that. Yeah. And uh, police had got him, and uh, he was tried and convicted for his offense. And he was sent to— I was going to say, what What are we talking What, two months in jail and <laughs> probation? Well, he was sent to the uh, men's colony in San Luis Obispo. Okay. While incarcerated there, he met and befriended uh, Lawrence Bittaker. And this is where the two evils meet. So, Bittaker and Norris initially become, became loosely acquainted in 1977, one year after uh, Norris arrived at San Luis Obispo. Okay. Uh, Bittaker's initial impression of Norris upon his arrival at the, at the colony was that he was a savvy individual who largely associated with hardened criminals from motorcycle, motorcycle gangs. Okay. In addition to dealing in contraband and drugs. The pair gradually became more closely acquainted and began talking in friendly terms when Norris taught Bittaker how to re- construct jewelry. Okay. Well, I guess they picked up a, a craft and the, I guess yeah. it's like – Like craft time. Yeah, craft time. I guess it would be like stuff that girls do nowadays. I don't know. What? Uh, according to Norris, <laughs> Bittaker saved him from being attacked by a fellow inmates uh, on at least two occasions. So now he owns him. Right. Yeah. Basically. Right. Yeah. yeah I've, I've saved your ass. Uh, by 1978, the pair become close acquaintances, discovering they shared an interest in sexual violence, and misogyny. Now, <laughs> the, so like you know, usually, normally, you know, guys find guy friends yeah. because you know they're both into like, I don't know, working on cars or. Playing pool or sports, yeah, or, yeah, they yeah. enjoy watching the Bears or yeah. you know, yeah. But like just that sentence alone, like, <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't want to make light of this. This is sick. Yeah, this whole it, case it is. is sick. Yeah, but I'm just like trying to imagine them meeting and being like, so uh, you into this? Yeah. And the exactly. other one being like, why? Yes, I am. And I then you, they just start having conversations about like it's such a weird, messed up thing. Yeah, but they're but they're criminals. Right. They got nothing else to talk about. That's right. I mean, I get that, that we don't have the same brains here. I mean, it's got to come up to some, something different at some point. you got to change the, the conversation. I, I don't know. I mean, you only talk about prison and food for so long. True. And you, only, you only talk about tossing <laughs> many times. Oh, my God. That's getting edited out. It is? <laughs> okay. I try to be light with it. That was light? Yeah. That was light. That, light. Yeah. So, if, long, so you know, here we are talking about sexual violence and misogyny. Uh, Norris also uh, divul- <laughs> Norris also uh, uh, divulging to Bittaker the biggest stimulation for him was seeing frightened young women, and adding this was the primary re- reason he had been amassed. This has been the primary reason uh, why he had amassed a lengthy record for sexual offenses. So he likes watching basically these girls in you know in pain. Again, how messed up that this is the conversation. Oh, it's it's sick. That this is the Yeah. Uh, it, like I just I can't my brain make it make sense. It, you know what I mean? It's like locker room talk to them. Which is craziness. Yeah. That is craziness. It's like, hey, we just, we just golfed today, and uh, we're back there changing into our clothes. Yeah. What'd you talk about? Oh, we talked about how I really enjoy the frightened look on a young girl's face as I'm attacking her. Yeah. Like, yeah. Sick people. 
Yeah. Well, yes. Bittaker, who is not known to have committed any sexual offenses prior to meeting Norris, himself divulged to Norris that if he ever raped a woman, he would kill her so not as to leave a witness to the crime. I, Mike, I can't. I know. I just, I can't. I, I already see where this is going. So, yeah. Bittaker, he's not, he hasn't committed any assault, sexual assaults mm. yet. Not yet. But this is almost this is how sick this case is, though. So they're having these conversations about what they're into mm-hmm. while they're in prison. And you got Norris talking about all about the sexual stuff. Bittaker brings up, "Well, I've never done that, but if I did, I'd kill her, so there wouldn't be a witness or whatever." I, and I can totally see where this is going with Norris being like, "Oh, well, I can show you yeah. what it's like." Yeah, show you what it's like. Like, oh, you've never done it? I'll show you. Yeah, like. Th- the, like, this is what normal dudes talk about. Like, you ever change the oil on your motorcycle? Yeah, no. Yeah. We'll come over Friday. We'll have some beer. I'll show you how to change the, the oil on the old Harley. Yeah. You know? The, like, this, the type of conversation they're having. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, hey, the Kubota, your Kubota, is not, the steering went out on it? Oh, you're probably low on hydraulic fluid. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, I don't know how to. How, how, do, you, how do you fix that? Do you know how to do that? Yeah, yeah. Come on over. I'll show you. Yeah. It. See, normal. Yeah. That's a normal man conversation right yeah, there. Yeah. These aren't men, though. They're. Demons, really? Well, they're 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 schizophrenic and they're uh, like bipolar and whatever else he's got going on, and very unintelligent, low IQs, right? Yeah, and uh, well, I don't know what the other guy's like IQ was, but he made it in the Navy, so he had to have some brain, something, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, these guys, they're they're sex fiends, what well, they are, yeah. But yet they like to watch, they like to inflict pain. And kill him. Crazy to me that they found each other. It really is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, how it, how they're, they're such an unlikely pair. Right. Well, I mean, they they go together very well. They do. As far as, I mean, obviously, we, what's, what, what's coming. But it's, like, just crazy to me that the world aligned for them to meet. You know what I mean? Yep. Well, um, because of uh, sloppy, poli- uh, sloppy work and... His other offenses. Yeah. Yeah, we'll let him out. Two months, he's good. He'll sit him out of the way. He's not a, he's not a threat. He's, not, he's healed. Yeah, he's not a threat to anybody. Were they drunk when they made that decision? He went from diagnosed schizophrenic to, he's fine. He's fine. He's all right. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. As they say under the breath, as long as he saves, takes his meds. When alone, the pair regularly discussed plans to assault and murder teenage girls after they were released. This shared fantasy invo- evolved into an elaborate plan to to murder one girl of each teenage year from the age of 13 through 19. So they're going to go out and grab a girl from each year and rape them. Like, how sick is this? Not only that they're plotting and planning, but like this kind of? Yeah. Like, we need one of each age. And, and, and you want to go get these kids that are just kids. Yeah. This is terrible. The pair vowed to become reacquainted once they were released. Hey, uh, when you get released, dude, okay, come look me up. At, uh, I'll be over here uh, waiting on you, sleeping in a tent. <laughs> God. But I won't do anything. I'll wait on you. Promise you, I won't do anything until you get out. It's craziness. Yeah. It's absolute nut house mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. So Bittaker was released from the California men's colony on October 15th, 1978. Okay. Uh, he returned to Los Angeles, found work as a skilled machinist. Okay. All right. Uh, this work earned a uh, bit of close to 1000 a week. Okay. Well, good money back then. Yeah, good money. 1000 a week? Yeah. That's more. That's. Yeah. That's good money. It is. Go ahead and say it. It's more than we make. <laughs> I was just thinking it is more than we make. Yeah. yeah. I mean. Yeah. That's. That is. And probably if, if he works overtime. God. So he had a good job, though, is the point here. He's a skilled machi- machinist for having a low IQ. Yeah. He's pretty good with m- machine work. Despite closing himself as a loner, he became friendly with several people in his neighborhood, earning a reputation as a generous and helpful individual who occasionally donated money to the Salvation Army. What? Upstanding citizen. What? Yes, man. He changed his life around. Yeah, until what's his nuts gets out. Yeah, he didn't. There's that. 
And then because uh, he's waiting, I know. He's so waiting. of course he's a model citizen right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then on occasion, uh, he is known to have purchased large quantities of fast fast food and wine, which he then handed to the homeless. Are you kidding me? <laughs> In downtown Los Angeles. This, you're serious. What what happened? He's gotta stay he's gotta do something to stay out of trouble until his buddy gets out. Oh my god. So he's gotta he's gotta put himself doing something. Okay. I, that's the only thing I can think of. In his mind, if I do this, I won't go to do that. Just, I don't understand why he didn't just stay this way. Just stay this way. But he can't. It's not in his. Yeah. It's not in him to be that way. So, anyway, Bittaker was particularly popular among the local teenagers. Of course. Of course, because he wants as his victims. Right. Yeah. And, uh,. <laughs> And uh, later admitted he uh, – the primary reason he always had beer and marijuana in his Burbank motel was that his residence would remain a popular palace for teenagers to socialize. Oh, well, yeah. He's providing beer and marijuana. Yeah. He's got the yeah. brewskis and the Mary Jane going on. Yeah. Of course they loved him. Let's go hang out at his place. Yeah. God. Go hang out with Bitter. Hey, he's at work. But he said we could hang out until, we, until he gets off. If only they knew. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, on January 15th, 1979, three months after Riddiker was released uh, from the California men's colony, Norris was released and moved into his mother's home in Redondo Beach. You mean they didn't just run to each other? No, no, not right off the bat. I'm surprised he didn't pick him up. Right? Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, you're on parole. If, if there's any conditions, you can't be hanging out with other offenders. Other parolees, yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, within one month of his release... He had raped a woman whom he – I'm not laughing at that. Sorry, I'm sorry. But it's just – it's the whole deal yeah. of his his time. Yeah. It's it just – none of this would happen, ever have happened. Right. If they would have just played – would have done it right way in the, a long time ago. Yeah. It, it just mm. – So what does he do now? He gets out – what did you say? Within what amount of time? Uh, it was within a month. Jesus. So his buddy stayed clean. Right. For mu- for three months. For three months. He can't even make it a month. Uh, so with, so uh, he raped a woman uh, and basically simply banned her in a desert. He just took her out to the desert and banned her. Uh, he soon found employment with an electrician in Compton. Compton. Okay. What, what song is that? Is that a song? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll sleep with that. Yeah. Shortly thereafter, he received a letter from Bittaker. Of course. Yeah. Well, he, in late February, and the, the pair met at a, at a hotel and rekindled their plan to kidnap and rape girls. So they have reconnected. Yes. Yep. Back together. Mm-mm-mm. In order for the pair to abduct teenage girls, Bittaker decided they would need a van as opposed to a car. Yep. Uh, with financial assistance from Norris, because he's got that military assistance still. Right. For, for school. Uh, but you can use it for anything because they just send you a check. Um, Bittaker uh, purchased a silver gray 1977 GMC Van These things were, I mean, if you bought the ones that were decked out. Right. That's not really decked out, but. Pretty basic. Like yeah. almost like a work van. Yeah, yeah, that one, yeah, pretty bitch, yeah. And we know what that's for. Right. Yeah, according to Bittaker, the when viewing uh, this sliding door, he realized he or Norris could pull up to a teenage girl real close, not have to open the doors all the way, and the pair would nickname this van Murder Mac. They named their van Murder Mac? Mm-hmm. M-A-C, Murder Mac, M-A-C. Jesus. Okay. From February to from February to June 1979, Bittaker and Norris picked up over 20 female hitchhikers. Okay, so they're almost they don't and they don't do anything, right? Uh, Are they like testing the waters here? They say they did not assault these girls in any manner. These practice runs were merely a way for them to develop rules ruses to lure girls into the van and voluntarily and voluntarily uh, to lure girls in the van voluntarily. Okay, so they're testing 
They're testing their water. They're testing what lines work. Yeah. To pull up to get girls to just get in on their own. Yeah. So they don't have to make a scene. Correct. So they're like, this is craziness. They're doing test runs basically Mm -hmm. to say, okay, now say, you know, we need, my mother's sick and we need help. And then that didn't work so well. So now they pull up to someone else and say, Hey, my my dog's lost. Hey, my dog, will you come help us look for my dog? And what they're looking for the best one. Yeah. Craziness. In late April, the pair found an isolated fire road in the San Gabriel Mountains. Uh, Bitteker broke open the lock gate with a crowbar and replaced the lock in which with one he owned. Okay. So they found they found their found their place they're going to go to. And, they, and I guess they learned what what works and what doesn't work. Well, and this place has a gate that they now have the key to. Mm-hmm. So one, when they show up, they don't really have to worry about anybody else already being there. Nope. And two, when they pull in, they can shut the gate behind them lock and lock it so they don't have to worry about anybody discovering them. Right. This is a lot of crazy planning going on. Yeah, a lot of premeditation. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to come to that point in the story that we're going to have to talk about some crimes. The victims. Yeah. yeah. Bittaker and Norris killed their first victim, 16-year-old uh, Lucinda Lynn Schaefer, on June 24, 1979. Schaefer was last seen leaving a Presbyterian church meeting in Redondo Beach. Uh, in his written accounts of the events of this day, Bittaker stated he and Norris first finished constructing the bed uh, the pair had installed in the rear of the van. Okay. Uh, beneath which they placed tools clothes, and a cooler filled with beer and soft drinks. Okay. Um, at which point, at uh, approximately 11 a.m., the pair drove to the beach area, drinking beer, smoking grass, and flirting with girls. Uh, we had no set routine, is what he said. Oh, he... That's what he yeah, basically saying, you know, when he was talking about this after years later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at approximately 7.46 p.m., Norris spotted Schaefer walking down a side street toward her grandmother's home and remarked to Bittaker, there's a cute little blonde. Mm, sick. After unsuc- unsuccessfully attempting to entice Schaefer into their van with alternative offers of marijuana and a lift home, Bittaker and Norris drove further ahead and parked alongside a driveway. Uh, Norris then ex- exited the vehicle, opened the passenger side sliding uh, door, and leaned into the van, with his head and shoulders obscured from view behind the door. When Schaefer passed the van, Norris exchanged a few words with her before dragging her into the van and closing the door. Uh, using a ruse they would repeat in most of their subsequent murders, Bittaker turned the radio to full volume um, as Norris bound the victim's arms and legs and gagged her with duct tape as Bittaker drove Schaefer to the fire road in the Gabriel Mountains. Mm. Um, where in April, uh, the pair had previously switched the locks. So, like, we were talking, this this is their yeah. road now. Yeah. For them to use. Uh, despite initially uh, screaming when she was abducted, Schaefer quickly regained her composure. In his written account of the night that followed, Bittaker wrote that Schaefer displayed a magnificent uh, state of self-control and composed acceptance of the conditions of which she had no control. See, that's sick. Don't don't write that crap. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, what an ass. Yeah. Honestly. Oh, I know. I know. You know. This is you know this is all court. Right. I'm sure it's all what came out in court. Yeah, but still, no. Yeah, yeah. and a statement to police. Um. She shed no tears, offered no resistance, and expressed no great concern for her safety. As she probably knew, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to live through this at yet, her age. Right. She knew. Yeah. I mean, there's enough people who have been abducted by in this, in this time frames, unfortunately. Right. Um, yeah, it says, I guess he says, I guess she knew what was coming. Yeah. Yeah. Sad. At the fire road, Norris first raped Schaefer after instructing uh, Bittaker to go take a walk and uh, return in one hour. Okay. Okay. Um, upon the, so upon returning to the van, Bittaker similarly uh, raped the girl in Norris's absence. Upon the second occasion in which she was raped by Norris uh, in Bittaker's absence, Schaefer asked him whether they intended to kill her. 
To which Norris replied, no. So uh, in response, Schaefer requested to be allowed time to pray before she was killed, if that was Bideker and Norris's intention. Um, mm. In their subsequent accounts of the actual murder, Bideker and Norris gave differing accounts as who argued over whether they should uh, kill her or rather than release her. Uh, each stated the the other argued that they should kill her. So basically, they're trying to play. They're blaming it. They're blaming on each other. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They're saying I didn't want to. I, I didn't want to. But he did. Yeah, Norris was all for it. Yeah, yeah. They think it's going to get him off something. I. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's kind of stupid, but whatever. So in any event, Schaefer pleaded, pleaded for uh, only one second to pray, and uh, for Norris attempted to eventually manually strangle her. Um, after about approximately forty-five seconds, he became uh, he became disturbed at the look in her her eyes, and uh, he ran to the front of the van, vomiting. What? Like he's having second. Like he, they decide to do all this sick crap, but now when they're doing it, all of a sudden he gets physically ill from it. Yeah, he couldn't handle it. Yeah, human human instinct kicked in. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, Bittaker then manually strangled her Schaefer until she collapsed to the ground and began convulsing. He then twisted um, a wire coat hanger around her neck with vice grip pliers until Schaefer's convulsions ceased. Uh, Schaefer was, den was denied her request to pray before Bittaker and Norris killed her. Schaefer's body was wrapped in a plastic shower curtain and thrown over a steep canyon Bittaker had selected. Uh, according to Norris, after Bittaker had thrown Schaefer over the canyon, Bittaker assured him the animals would eat her up so there wouldn't be any evidence left. So on July 8th, 1979, two weeks after the murder of Schaefer, Bittaker and Norris encountered a 18-year-old Andrea Joy Hall hitchhiking along the PCH, Pacific Coast Highway. As the pair slowed the van to offer Hall a lift, another vehicle pulled over and offered Hall exactly that, um, which she accepted. Bittaker and Norris followed the vehicle from a distance until Hall ex exited the vehicle at Redondo Beach. So she took the other offer. But, instead with them. But then they followed her anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because they're, they're pissed probably because. She rejected them. Rejected them. Yeah. So on this occasion, uh, Norris hid in the back of the van in order to dupe Paul into believing Bittaker was traveling alone. Um, inside the van, Bittaker had offered Hall a cold drink from the cooler in the rear of the van. Okay. And then uh, Norris, who had hidden behind a, white, uh, a bedspread in the rear of the van, Pounced on Hall when she attempted to retrieve the drink, and after a strenuous fight, managed to subdue her by twisting her arm and behind her back, causing her to scream in pain. Norris then gagged Hall with an adhesive tape and bound her wrists and ankles. Uh, Bittaker and Norris drove Hall to a location in San Gabriel Mountains again, now beyond where they had beyond where they had earlier taken Schaefer. You know, um, at this location, she was raped twice by Bittaker and once by Norris. While Bittaker was raping her for the second time, Norris saw what he believed to be vehicle headlights approaching. Uh, Bittaker clasped his hand over Hall's mouth and dragged her into a near into nearby brush bushes. As Norris drove in an unsuccessful search uh, for the vehicle he thought he had seen, when he returned, the pair drove to a location farther in the San Gabriel Mountains. Bittaker forced Hall to walk uphill naked alongside the road and then perform oral sex on him. Jesus. Uh, before ordering Hall to pose for several Polaroid pictures. God, they're just, they're escalating mm -hmm. already. Like, oh, yeah. they've, they've only had one victim before this. Yep. And yeah. now they're adding in all this other crazy nonsense. Uh, Bittaker and Norris uh, drove Hall to a third location where Bittaker again walked Hall up a uh, Nearby hill. This time as Norris drove to a nearby store to purchase alcohol. Uh, when Norris uh, when Norris returned, Bittaker was alone and in his possession of two further Polaroid pictures he had taken, both of which depicted Hall's face and expressions. Norris later described as being of sheer terror as she begged for her life to be spared. 
Bittaker informed Norris that uh, he told he told Hall he was going to kill her and challenged her to give it, give him as many re- reasons as he could come up with as to why she should be allowed to live. Sick. Mm-hmm. Uh, before thrusting an ice pick through one ear, through her ear into her brain. Good God. He then turned her body over and thrust the ice pick into the other ear, stomping on it until the handle broke. Oh, my good God. Bittaker then strangled Hall before throwing her body off a cliff. Jesus, man. I didn't know that about this case. Good Lord. Escal- I mean, that yeah, is yeah. escalating the definition of. Oh, yeah. By, by girl, too. They've... Uh, these guys are complete monsters. Yeah. I mean, oh yeah, no, the words, yeah, monster. And this is why I don't understand with the first one why he's puking. After he starts to strangle a girl and he pukes because it makes him sick to see the look in her eyes. And now we've on victim two escalated to this ice pick stomping thing. Like, but they, I mean, you know, they say it's not unusual for. I mean, like somebody, like people have, like guys that go to war. You know, and you make your first kill. You don't think nothing about it till you're up on top of that person and you see what they look like, you know, in that twisted mass that they're in. You know, it could be two days later and, you know, bloating's kicked in and the smell. And then that's, you know, you, you throw up when you see it. Right. But then you don't, the next person you have to kill, you don't grab an ice pick and stomp it through their no, head. And, no, but I'm just saying that it's that human nature. I just. But that's what I'm saying. How do you have that human nature with the first one? Mm-hmm. And now with the second one, you're doing all this stuff with an ice pick. Because he enjoyed it after after it was all said and done. He realized he I think he enjoyed it. Okay, that's why he was able to continue. Yeah, he had to have. I, I'm, not, I'm not the guy, and I'm not. No, I know. I, it's just crazy to me the escalation. Yeah, we go from puking after just starting to strangle mm-hmm. somebody to all this other crazy morbid stuff. But they like to inflict pain. And the more pain you inflict, I think the more excited they got. Yeah. So, you know, let's take it a next step higher and see how, how it goes, you know? How far can we take this? It's craziness. Yeah. But they're, but they're, they were cured, remember? Well, he was. He was, well, yeah. 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 Not a threat to society. Not a threat to society. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to have seen that prosecutor when he got that. Right. Probably didn't care. Yeah, probably not. Probably the same prosecutor in that same county. Um, on September 3rd, uh, Bittaker and Norris observed two girls named Jackie Doris Gillum and Jacqueline Lee Lamp sitting on a bus stop bench near Hermosa Beach. Uh, Lamp ha- and uh, Gilliam had been hitchhiking along the PCH Highway, which was popu- big and popular in those days. Oh, yeah, Pacific Coast Highway, man. That's, yeah. yeah. Lamp and uh, Gillum had been hitchhiking along the PCH uh, and were observed, and uh, they observed them uh, resting at a bus stop. Bittaker and Norris offered the girls a ride, which Gillum and Lamp accepted. And inside the van, both girls were offered marijuana uh, by Norris, which they accepted. Okay. Okay. Shortly after entering the van, both girls realized that Bittaker had steered the van off the PCH and was driving in the direction of the San Gabriel Mountains. Uh, When the girls protested, both Bittaker and Norris attempted to allay the girls' concerns with excuses. Which did not deceive either girl. Lamp, age 13, uh, attempted to open the sliding door, whereupon Norris hit her on the back of the head with a bag filled with lay, uh, lead weights. Jesus. Yeah. Talk about the MO changing, though. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, this would be hard to investigate. Yeah. You know, usually killers have the same MO. You know, they stab in a certain area or they mutilate a certain area or, you know, the method of killing is a yeah. certain way. But so far it's like all, just whatever, it's all whatever, over the place. Whatever tools are available. Yeah. Uh, briefly knocking her unconscious uh, before overpowering 15 year old Gillum. Um, as he began to bind it and gag Gillum, Lamp regained consciousness and again attempted to flee the van whereupon Norris twisted her arm uh, behind her back and again, uh, dragged her back into the van. Yeah. As this struggle ensued, Bittaker 
noting the girl's struggle, was in full view of potential witnesses, stopped the, the van, punched Will, Gillum in the face, and assisted Norris in finishing binding and gagging the two girls. And, uh, Gillum and Lamp were, uh, were driven to the San Gabriel Mountains, where they were held captive for almost two days. Oh, damn. Okay. Yes. Uh, being uh, bound and gagged between repeated instances of sexual and physical abuse. So they stepped up, stepped up this time. Yeah. They took it another way, two notches up. Oh, yeah. Uh, both men slept in the van alongside their hostages, with each alternatively acting as a lookout. Um, on one occasion, Bittaker walked Lamp into a nearby hill and forced her to pose for pornographic pictures before returning her to the van. Um, Bittaker also uh, asked Norris to take several Polaroid pictures of himself and Gillum, uh, both nude and both nude and clothed. Okay. In the first of three instances, instances which uh, in which Bittaker raped Gillum, uh, he also created a tape recording of himself raping her, forcing the girl to pretend she was his cousin. Jesus. And informing Gillum to feel free to express her pain. Because he wanted the recording of it. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, Bittaker is also known to have tortured Gillum by stabbing her breasts with an ice pick and using vice grip pliers to tear off part of one nipple. Oh, my God. After almost two days of captivity, Lamp and Gillum were murdered at uh, Bittaker's substantial tr- uh, sus- subsequent trial. Sorry. Uh, Norris claimed he had suggested that Gillum be qu- killed quickly, as unlike Lamp, she had been largely cooperative throughout the period of her captivity, whereupon Bittaker replied, no, they only die once anyway. Jesus, really? Yeah, really. Uh, Gillum was struck in each ear with an ice pick and then strangled to death. Okay. And after Bittaker had uh, murdered Gillum, he then forced Lamp out of the van upon exiting the sliding door Bittaker shouted to her, uh, you wanted to stay a virgin, now you can die a virgin. So did they not assault her? I, they didn't really say much on that one. I think they just bound and gagged her. Okay, so they didn't. I don't think so. Hmm. God, these guys are messed up, aren't they? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, before Norris struck her upon the head with a sledgehammer. Jesus. Mm-hmm. Bittaker then strangled Lamp until he believed she had died. And then when Lamp opened her eyes, Norris again bludgeoned her repeatedly as Bittaker strangled her to death. The bodies of Gillum and Lamp were thrown over an embankment into the chaparral. Yeah, yeah. Ramped it up again. Oh, yeah. They've really... It's crazy to see how they progress so so much mm-hmm. with each do you know what i'm saying like this like you said this is another huge like two victims at once yeah and they actually kept them for a couple of days and yeah keeping them they took that risk i yeah it, it, it's it just it's like where does this go now you know like yeah ugh. yeah and you know it's it's just i, I mean i i hate <laughs> It's not a fun story to read through, I get. Right. You know, and it is it is sick. But I mean, I just it's just hard to believe to fathom that there are people out there that are willing to do this. Right. To another person. Right. One person, let alone two people who meet each other and decide to do and ha- this yeah, together. Yeah, and have the same thoughts. Yeah. It's insane. Bittaker and Norris abducted their final victim, sixteen year old Sidney Lynette Ledford. On October 31st, 1979, uh, Ledford was abducted as she stood outside a gas station, hitchhiking home from a Halloween party in the Sunland uh, Tujunga suburb of uh, Los Angeles. Investigators believe Ledford accepted a ride from home from Bittaker and uh, Norris because she recognized Bittaker. Oh, what did she recognize him from? As he, he was known to have frequented the McDonald's restaurant in which she had held a part-time job. Oh, man. So. They were staking her out. He used, you know, the. Mm-hmm. What's the word I'm looking for? The fact that they, she knew him 
as like a comfort level yeah. type thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, plus, I mean, they were staking her out because it, that's, that was his interest. I think that he had made up his mind at that point. Right. She was going to be the next one. Yeah. Upon accepting the offer of a lift home and entering the van, Ledford was offered marijuana by Norris, which she refused. Okay. Uh, Bittaker drove the van to a, a secluded street where Norris drew a knife, then bound and gagged Ledford with construction tape. Uh, Bittaker then traded places with Norris, who drove in an aimless manner for in excess of an hour, as Bittaker remained with Ledford in the back of the van. After removing the uh, construction tape from the girl's mouth and legs, Bittaker tormented Ledford, initially slapping and mocking her, then beating her with fists as he repeatedly shouted for her to say something. Then as Ledford began screaming, shouting it for her to scream louder, as Ledford continued screaming, Bittaker began asking her as he struck her, what's the matter? Don't you like to scream? Sick, man. As Ledford began to cry, she pleaded with Bittaker repeatedly saying, no, don't touch me. In response, Bittaker ordered her to scream as loud as she wished and then began alternately striking uh, her with a hammer, beating her breasts with his fists and torturing her with pliers between and throughout instances. When he raped and sodomized her. Oh, my God. Uh, repeatedly, Ledford can be heard pleading for the abuse to cease and making statements such as, oh, no, no, as sounds of Bittaker alternately extricating either the sledgehammer or the pliers from the toolbox can be heard on a, on the ta- on a tape recording he made after entering the, the rear of the van. Uh, Norris later described uh, hearing screams, constant screams, emanating from the rear of the van as he drove. Shortly after uh, Norris switched places with Bittaker, he found himself he he found himself himself switched on the tape recorder that Bittaker had used to record much of the time. Uh, he had been in the rear of the van with Ledford. Uh, Norris first shouted for Ledford to go ahead and scream, or I'll make you scream. Uh, in response, Ledford pleaded, I'll scream if you stop hitting me, then admitted several high-pitched screams as Norris encouraged her to continue until he ordered her to stop. Good God. I say, I think she was probably the worst victim. Yeah? Yeah. Norris then reached for the sledgehammer as Ledford, seeing him do this, screamed, oh no. Norris then struck Ledford once, one upon, once upon the left elbow... In response, she informed Norris he had broken her elbow before pleading, don't hit me again. In response, Norris again raised the sledgehammer as Ledford repeatedly screamed, no. Norris then proceeded to strike Ledford 25 consecutive times upon the same elbow with the sledgehammer. Good God. Before asking her, what are you sniveling about? As Ledford continuously screamed and wept. Uh, if you ever heard this tape, there's just no possible way that you'd not begin uh, crying and trembling. I doubt you could listen to more than a full 60 seconds of this, the, video, the tape that they made. Who said that? Uh, it was, I think it was in court. So just to be clear, though. Yeah. Uh, we found the recording. Yeah. And, we're, and we found where Roy basically was describing his recollections of the audio uh, tape the pair had created at Sherry Ledford's rape and torture from April 1997. So he made that statement. In court. Yeah. But the point I wanted to make is I I don't want to play it. I don't think we should play it. I, you know, it's it's out there. It's on YouTube. We don't. We you. So, so you can, what's out there, basically? I mean, you know, it, what is out there? There's one minute and seven seconds. I think is what it is. It's just you hear her screaming. Right. And it was recorded by one of the. Uh, it was recorded by uh, one of the the uh, news guys that was out in the uh, hallway. Like as they played it in court. Yeah. There wasn't a news guy in the van. No. It was. No. It was when, when they were court. He recorded it when they played it in court. Yeah. Um, and all, all all he got was like that last minute and seven seconds. Right. I, I you can hate me, Mike. No, I, no, 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 no. I I don't, I don't want to play it. I don't. No, we I don't, don't have to. I, you know, I left it as an option. If we um, 
you know, if I can find the link to it or whatever, I guess I can put that in the description. All they need if to do, people all, wanna all they gotta do is hit put her name in and uh into uh YouTube and it'll pop up. Yeah. I, I just don't feel comfortable. I mean, I, the part I, I, I couldn't I couldn't listen to the whole thing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's this is probably the worst story we've ever done. Yeah. Um to date, yeah, probably. And I I couldn't make it through it myself. No. So I don't want I don't want, put, I don't want to put that up there. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's out there already. If if you guys are there's really a lot of out. podcasts out there that have it on their they've done it. Just search her name and you'll you'll find it on YouTube on YouTube. Yeah. I'm just not comfortable. You're fine. I'm good. We're good. Okay. I'm not mad at you. Yeah. It, but it is. It's horrifying. It is. It, it is. is the worst. It is the it, it it is basically like they said. You'll it's a scream that you'll never hear in a movie. It is without a doubt the most horrifying piece of audio I've ever listened to. Yeah, this is worse than to, and we didn't play the toy box killer Mm-mm. audio, which wasn't even of a murder. It was just his pre recording of him speaking, speaking to his, his victim. Mom, yeah, about what to, he's going to do to him. Right. And, and that was sick. This guy is actually this torturing is, her. It's an actual recording of the murder taking place, and it's it's the most disgusting thing that I've ever started to listen to. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Ooh. We have the transcript somewhere too. Yeah, uh, we could always, if we want, we can read that off. I mean, you read a bunch of what you just read. Yeah, was true. Part of that transcript of her, you yeah. know, pleading and and the sounds of him getting in the toolbox, toolbox. and striking her, and yeah, it's this whole story is really just unbelievable. It really is. Yeah, I mean, and, and luckily, thank God, it didn't last. Luckily, these guys weren't doing this for ten years, right? You know, luckily they. Uh, After approximately two hours of captivity, Norris killed Ledford by strangling her with a water coat hanger, which he tightened with pliers. Ledford did not react much to the act of the strangulation, although she died with her eyes wide open. Eyes open. I mean, I don't think she'd had anything left in her. Right. At that point. Um, Ledford did not react much to, the, you know, he just shouldn't have much. Um, and Bittaker then opted to dis- discard uh, her body on a random lawn in order to view the on a random lawn in order to view the rea- reaction from the press. So, so see, they, they got sloppy with this part. Well, and here again, they're trying to up their thing again and do mm-hmm. something new they haven't done. Yep. And, and and I'm glad, I mean, it's a good thing they did in a way. Right. Um, well, because it leads to them, just to be clear, because it leads to them getting caught and being exactly. stopped from doing this to anybody Correct. else. Yes. But yeah, I mean, it's not a good thing, you know, the actual murder happened, but. Correct. Um, I always like it, if that's the right word, when killers get sloppy, because that's how they get caught. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they get bored with what they're doing. Right. And they want, they, how can I step up the, uh, how can I step up? The shock and awe, awe of the public, so that the press will have a field day with it, and we'll get to see yeah. our work. And then they'll come up with a cool name for us, right? Which I don't know about toolbox murders, but our killers. But they, they got a name made for them, right? Um. But anyway, so um, they put it out on this on this lawn, uh, kind of, just kind of. Posed her out, uh, basically in a way to would defile and, and you know insult her, right? And that would make the the, the uh, press freak out about it. A leper's body was found by a jogger. Then the following morning, um, okay. an autopsy revealed that in addition to having been sexually violated, she had died of strangulation after receiving excessive, extensive blunt force trauma to the face, head, breasts, and left elbow. With uh, her all of Cronin uh, sustaining multiple uh, fractures, which I assume that's probably something to do with the elbow point of the elbow area. Yeah, um, her uh, her left hand bore a puncture wound, and a finger on her right hand had been slashed. Bittaker would later claim the tape on the tape the tape recording the period created of Ledford's clear abuse and torture. Uh, Offered nothing other than evidence of a threesome. 
Oh, that's his. That's his defense. Oh, dude, is that his this, defense is sick. That it's uh, that it was all consensual. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Jesus. Uh, adding that uh, toward the very end, Ledford was screaming for him and Norris to kill her. Oh, so that makes it okay. Yeah, because she asked to be. That gets you off the hook. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's that's all I'm going to go on today. We're going to make this a two parter. Yeah. There's a little bit more left on this, so we're going to leave you hanging for a week. Yeah, yeah. We are uh, we're approaching an hour and a half here. Yeah, want to keep these uh, keep too long. Go- and dude, well, I need a break, man. Yeah, like yeah. like I am actually after listening to this and the details, like I'm not only sick to my stomach, but I'm like pissed off. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like it's not very often I get like pissed off at a true crime story. Like I'm pissed right now. Well, because you know, it shows. It just shows you that the system fucked up a long time ago. Nor should have never been on. Nor should have never met this guy. Well, and we hear that way too often. Like I said before. Oh yeah. Like this all could have been prevented. I think that's what pisses me off the most. Yeah. But obviously, I'm pissed at these two ass hats as well. Well, I mean, if they even if they had not met up, Norris would have continued this type of life. Right. But I don't think he. I don't think bitter would. I don't think he would have gotten. Bitteker would have gotten into it if he wasn't. He just would have been a murderer. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I need a break, man. So yeah, we'll make yeah. this a two parter. Uh, make sure you subscribe right now, yes. so you get notified next week when part two of this comes out. We'll talk about how these idiots are caught finally, um, and whether or not they're they're brought to justice. But I need to lighten the mood right now, and hopefully this will be like the last. Now, I mean, this isn't going to be the last one like this. I'm sorry. Oh God! Dude, there, I mean, there, there's. I know there's there, a lot of sick stories out there. Uh, you're right. You're right. But we need to lighten the mood. Okay. So well, you know what time it is? We love death. All right. So we've been lucking out. We, we're getting a whole bunch of people signing up. Yep. So. If you have not signed up yet to play the Wheel of Death, you need to sign up. Now is your time because everyone so far has been lucking out because they've only been like the only person. Yeah. Yeah. But we're we're starting to get our bucket of doom here is growing. Yeah. And uh Andy is uh, drawing the name or is uh he's the one's been getting the drawn to spin the wheel, so Yeah. Yeah. Like But hey, you know what? I've improved uh, people. Uh, yeah, just put it out there. You've, I've improved. You've gotten your record is getting better. Yeah, I won that. What I won that one girl. The uh, we get her. She got a sweatshirt. Oh yeah, she's been well, wearing she got the it, gift I card. Hear. She got the gift card. Oh, the gift. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, she got the gift card. She got her sweatshirt. Yeah. So so he's that, that's a good that's a good one. He's he's improving. He's yeah, improving. Right, man, come on, man. Give, a, give the old man a little credit. Jeez. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is, is if you want to sign up, you want a really good chance to play, do it now because the list is growing. Yes. And then your chances become slimmer. Slim. So can I, is there any way you'll let me do the honors yeah, go ahead. today? Yeah. I can draw today? Yep. Okay. I just, I don't, have I ever done this yet? No. God, the heavy, bucket's heavy, dude. Come on, take it, take it. God damn, Jesus. All right. This week we have Amanda. So we're going to get a hold of Amanda, okay. uh, get her on the on the line here, and we'll have her spin the wheel of death. Awesome. Well, hello, Amanda. Hi, how are you? Doing good. How are you doing? I'm great. Well, thank you very much for signing up, and welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you. I'm excited. Hey. Sorry. I'm over here. <laughs> I can't see nothing. <laughs> Jesus, I can't see. I'm over here. Hi. Somewhere. <laughs> I can see you. Okay. All right. Okay. That's, that's good. The, that's the that's the best part. That's awesome. Where are you calling from today? I'm calling from Rushville, Illinois. Rushville, Illinois. Illinois. Okay. Right. Where's that? It's, uh... Central Illinois. Central. A very Central. small town. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Very cool. Well, again, thanks for thanks for signing up. Um, yeah. I will explain the wheel of death here to you just a little bit. Um, if you um, obviously you've seen this before because you signed up, but we do have some new items up here on our wheel. We have removed. Two of the death spaces. That was because of me. Yes, that was because of Mike. Um, so two of the death spaces are gone, which means there's only two chances that you have to lose. In their places, we've added um, some of our crime coffee and what the hell else? Posters. We oh, and uh, a selection of one of our mock movie posters behind us. Okay. So knowing our track records, who do you want to have spin for you? 
I'm going to choose Andy. Yes. Golly, man. It's that reputation, man. Your reputation. You ruined it, man. You ruined it. You ruined it. <laughs> man, I'm going to start putting it out there. Jesus. All right. <laughs> Do you want me to just give it all I got or you want me to give a half spin? What's the... Uh... Give it all you got. All I got. Okay. I got much. So here we go. All right. Here we go. You got that in so I can... Yeah, I got... Yeah. Round and round it goes. Where it stops. No death, no death, no death. Oh. It's a Wheel of Death t-shirt. Awesome. Which yep. is awesome because the only way to get a Wheel of Death t-shirt is by winning it on the Wheel of Death. Yeah. Where's mine at? <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> okay. It's coming. Uh, so, Amanda, what we'll do uh, when we're done recording this evening, I will send you um, an email to get your shipping information, all that good stuff, and then we will get that shirt in the mail for you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for being a fan and calling in to play the Wheel of Death. Yeah. Thank you. You guys have a good night. All right. Hey, you, you too. too. Thank you. Uh, bye. bye. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, congratulations right. again. Job. Another another win. Nice though. Another Wheel of Death shirt yep. going out. The exclusive Wheel That's of Death shirt. Is that the third one? That's three now. Three. Yeah. Well, if you include yours that I haven't given you yet. That's three. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's three. I'll I'm never. I'm I'll, sorry, man. I'm I'll good. Never I'll get on get it. it. I'll I never kinda, get it. To be honest, I kind of forgot. I think he was teasing me. No, I wasn't teasing. I was being honest. I just I kind of forgot about it. I have to put that on the whiteboard. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, it's not. I'm not. I'm in control of the whiteboard. It's not oh, happening, man. I'm gonna have to get control of that thing. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, I know it was a sick, heavy episode. It, it, it's a heavy one. This um, is gonna be a heavy one. Yeah. If you if you enjoyed it though, you want to see more, um, and you'd like to support the show, head on over to buymeacoffee.com/slash two murder morons. There, you can simply buy Mike and I and coffee, yep. or you can sign up to be a member for exclusive benefits, including bonus episodes. We have a ton of bonus episodes now. We I mean, we're getting quite we're the library on there. Pretty and good on that one. Members get access to the full library. So yep. um, head on over to buymeacoffee.com slash tumor or morons or scan the QR code on your screen. Yep. Or just buy us a coffee. Or just buy us a coffee. Yeah. Uh, we got to talk about merch. merch. We yep. got merch. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, yep. Shirts, hats, underwear, uh, whatever. I mean, we're just trying to come up with ways for people to support the show and be proud yeah. to be a supporter of the show. Maybe we could make uh, diapers. Diapers? Uh, yeah. Like cloth diapers? <laughs> the kind you have to wash. Did you just say golf diapers? Cloth. Oh, I was like, what the hell are golf diapers? Cloth. Oh, my God. I'm not. And you would think with me hearing you directly into my brain with exactly. this thing on, yeah. I would know what you were cloth. saying. I said cloth. Cloth diapers. Okay. Yeah. Well, regardless of what, what, what you may yeah. want, check out, you know, just check out our website in general. I think it's pretty it's cool. cool. You can watch and listen to episodes there. We got our merch store. We got all that stuff going on. Yeah, we do. But uh, scan the QR code on your screen to head there. Yeah. Um, Simple. I'll, What's that? Simple to do. Simple to do. Two murder morons.com. Yep. Also, we have to get credit where credit is due. We read from and discussed the Wikipedia article on this true crime um, to create this episode. So a link is in the description below. Got, it's a good, good place to go to. Oh, yeah. But yep. if, you, if you want to check out the original article for yourself, it's yep. links in the description. Yep. And there's been a movie on this. Oh, a yeah. A movie made. I mean, there's, I mean, this is like any, like all of them. They've gotten their attention and books have been written and movies made and. It's just something about something about California in the seventies. I know. It seems like they all come out of that era, era yeah. and area. Yeah, it just it's just it's just amazing. Yeah, how that one? How I don't know. I don't know what it is about California. I don't get it. No, I don't know. <laughs> Some something in the water, I guess. Could be. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, stay tuned. Part two is coming up next week. We yep. hope you join us. We I, thank you for being here with us this week. And I'm going to read it again. So, hey, I'm, I'm trying, guys. Just bear with me. I'm trying to get better at this. You do fine. And, Andy's the pro. I'm, I'm uh, the... It, it, not a pro whatsoever, but thank you for yeah. saying that. Yeah. But we'll see you guys all next Wednesday. Yep. All right. See you Thanks, guys. guys.